yeah, thank you for coming tonight and um, listening to a talk on historical resonances illuminated the Chinese handwritten volumes on health care of the 16th through 20th century. This is a, yeah, I might say a unique collection. Um, this collection dates from the 1970s through the 19, yeah, more than, even later than the 1990s, when my wife and I discovered on markets and, of course, in shops in China, in Japan and on Taiwan, manuscripts written by physicians, by pharmacists, by shamans, by exorcists, by private households, where these people noted down knowledge they thought was useful for their private either therapeutic activity or just for their private life. And this means that these manuscripts, now someone must help me to switch it. Okay. These manuscripts are valuable for several reasons. One of them is that they're very different and offer very different information from so-called printed medical literature. Historians, of course, basically base their work on printed literature. And there is hardly any other medical tradition in Europe or elsewhere where you have as many texts covering the past 2,000 years as in China. But printed medical literature, as rich as it is, offers us a view, presumably solely on a formally trained upper class. And the relevance of the Berlin collection is that we open a window to a much wider segment of Chinese population. Presumably, if you look at the writings and at the contents and at the style of these manuscripts, you see that not only highly literate, highly educated, upper-class authors uh, prepared these volumes, but people who just had learned to write and presumably to read. So the extension of visibility of historical facts through these volumes is one of its values, one of the values of that collection. Altogether, we collected about 1,100 handwritten volumes. They are now available worldwide. Um, as Samlung Unschuld from the uh, catalog of the Staatsbibliothek Preußische Kulturbesitz, some of them are in the Ethnologisches Museum Berlin-Dahlem. The earliest one is from 1583, and the most recent ones are from the 1960s. We collected several veterinary manuscripts. Um, of course, there were vets and individuals and peasants who would prepare uh, volumes where they noted down how to help camels, dromedars, how to help cows or horses. But today I shall focus solely on human therapeutics. Some of these volumes and some of these manuscripts uh, appear to be difficult to read, to say the least. <laughs> and others are quite ordinary, are quite wonderful, because as this one here looks like, was prepared for subsequent publication. Obviously, it has never been published because we couldn't find the title in any catalog. Uh, so we have some complete books with prefaces, with table of contents, and this is one example. We have others where the authors noted, sometimes with color as here, specific um, disciplines within therapeutics. And as you can see, this is tongue diagnosis. And if you compare this to modern textbooks on TCM tongue diagnosis, you'll see uh, some of this uh, still is relevant and is taught to and learned by practitioners. Some of the manuscripts are, at first glance, a bit confusing. For those of you who know Chinese, I mean, would you please read this? Yeah. What is this? And uh, it's very easy. 
these are Buddhist texts, and you have to turn them around all the time. And then you start reading here, and then there, and then there. And this, too, you have to turn the manuscript around, and this is symbolic. You make the wheel rotating. So some of these texts at first uh, were a bit irritating, but in the end, of course, it's very meaningful. Also, we encounter in these manuscripts secret numbers, a secret number system that is used in historical Chinese apothecary shops, and very, very few Chinese today would be able to read these numbers, but they are very convenient because, as you can see, one, two, three, four, easy, but the number like 228, yeah, one, two, three, four, five characters fill just the space of one character, and that, of course, is very economic. The question that early, of course, uh, arose was, how can we identify the age of these manuscripts? Very few have, for reasons unknown, a date given. This one here has a date, Daming, and uh, Tungjin, period of rain, which is 1628 to 1644. There are others where the nature of contents tells us something about the age. So this one here on aspirin, asopilin, of course can't be older than the introduction of aspirin uh, to China. And then, of course, there are the, those where we see an observation of taboos. As uh, those of you familiar with China know, when a new emperor or empress rose to the throne in China. Uh, the personal name was tabooed, and all characters uh, similar to or identical with uh, such a personal name were then forbidden in public use. And uh, here, for instance, we have Xuan, a character in the name of Emperor Kangxi. And uh, Xuan, of course, uh, in vision, is a term often found in medical texts. So one of the solutions was to just write it with one dot omitted. Yeah. You see, so once you encounter such a character in a manuscript, you know it must have uh, must be related uh, to the time when this character was tabooed. Or here is another uh, emperor, Jia Qing, in 1796 to 1820, and his personal name was Yong Yen. And there, of course, you have Yen, flaming, and characters like phlegm in Chinese medicine having these two fires above each other. They were changed to fire and yo underneath. So this helps us. Uh, to identify. And then, of course, one of the more famous taboos is the taboo on the personal name of Confucius, Chu. And one Chinese character most often encountered in Chinese medical texts is Xu, which means something like depletion or hollowness or emptiness, and it very often is used in Chinese medical, traditional medical theory, and it could no longer be written as it had been uh, until 1725 and needed to be changed to the type of writing that we know today. This, by the way, is a, a beautiful uh, manuscript. It's the oldest in the collection, dated 1583, and it's on the Twina um, therapy. Uh, very nice. So the question is, what do we learn from these handwritten manuscripts? I mean, is there anything they can tell us? Yes, they can tell us a lot. For instance, to the left you see a drawing of a person where someone noted 
all the names of acupuncture needle insertion holes. Fine. But on the right side is very more interesting. Because here you have a depiction of conduits with a start, T, and an end, drip. And that is interesting because you would not find any printed text ever since Han Dynasty where the 12, or how many you believe there are, conduits are not shown as a circular system, one tied to another. This is pre-Han thinking, that you have individual conduits starting at a point and ending at a point. And uh, for instance, in the Mawangdui manuscripts of the third century BC, this is the idea. You have individual tubes or, you know, yeah, let's say vessels, and these vessels can move and they have movement and they have contents that sometimes throb and sometimes are quiet, etc. And then with the Huang Dinajing Su Wen, all this changed in that a permanent circulation was thought of and all the, con the, the former separate conduits were now part of a large circulatory system. And here then you see the ends and the beginnings, etc. Interesting. So from these manuscripts, we realize that some very, very old ideas survive on a folk level that have not survived in printed literature. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Manuscripts permit us or offer to us a visual explanation of disease terms. These are disease terms here, for instance, Yodzefan a centipede-like convulsion. These are disease types that we encounter in printed medical literature, but without explanation. And here, some unknown author, 100 or 200 years ago, thought, I draw this and I show the animal after which the disease was named, and the posture, convulsions, adopted by a patient Having this, and of course, this is a huge manuscript with lots of such uh, comparisons, and also this one here, crow and dog-like convulsion. And if you if you uh, see the text for those of you, we have Oton, Oton, O Yang, or Shen Qing, Shang Tu, Xiao Xie, Wu Mang Yan. So, so many symptoms are mentioned here. Yeah, the body looks greenish. Above you vomit. Below you have diarrhea. You cannot speak. Aphasia. Uh, lower abdomen, painful, etc. These are explanations. Maybe a student or. Uh, Rookie in the field noted down when he was taught this by his teacher, but we don't find print literature where such explanations are given. I still recall when I, for the first time in a printed medical text, encountered the term Chongli Yu, living carp or generation of a carp in the body. Very strange. I couldn't imagine it. I couldn't think of what this might mean. And then in these manuscripts, you have the explanation. Yeah, there was a disease, a concept of disease that truly a carp grows in your abdomen, or another example, a living turtle symptom. Yeah, Sheng Gui Zheng. These are invaluable information that help us greatly to understand printed literature because there you never find these explanations. We also have visual explanations of disease locations. Many people who believe in traditional Chinese medicine claim that Chinese medicine has a disease concept of a holistic 
involvement of the entire organ. Well, that's fine, but it is a typical example of a partial adoption of historical heritage. The fact is, Chinese medicine, very much just like modern Western medicine or European traditional medicine, knew that certain diseases may be located at very specific locations in the human organism and that you have to use therapies and have to use substance-based interventions in order to directly reach the location, the venue of that particular disease. That does not fit into the image of TCM that is conveyed today by those who want to get away from Western medicine, but it is part of the historical heritage. And of course, it's found in these manuscripts where you have lots of um, examples where we are being taught um, the location of a disease. And also some unknown author noted himself, I guess, less herself, uh, whether diseases are curable or not. Whether a disease is inauspicious, good, don't treat, can't be cured, or is auspicious, can be cured. Yeah, All of this you do not find in medical term. We also find something that is, <laughs> yeah, I might say, uh, abhorred by modern TCM followers in the West, that is a listing of needle insertion points for precisely defined therapeutic indications without any theoretical background. Most people who enter TCM in Western countries believe that prior to applying acupuncture, needle insertion, they need to study yin-yang theory, five phases theory, the very complex theoretical background. Uh, and once you have mastered this theoretical background, then you are able to apply traditional Chinese medicine, in particular acupuncture. Interestingly, in these manuscripts, you hardly find any mention of yin-yang and five phases. Yin-yang and five phases theories were a playground of the elite. We do not even know whether the elite was able to or interested in applying these theories in actual daily therapeutics. In the manuscripts, and we do not only have folk medicine manuscripts, we also have many manuscripts obviously written by very erudite authors. There's hardly any reference to yin-yang and five faces. Yeah? So here, an example, you read the therapeutic indication, da bian nan, yung li to gong, difficult defecation, pressing with force results in anal prolapse. And then you're given four or five different needle insertion points, each with location and dosage. Here, three more examples from the same manuscript piercing, pain in the chest, or unending hiccough, or dripping rough and blocked urination, always the same. You have a couple of acupuncture needle insertion holes, and then you have more specific advice, but definitely not theoretically underpinned. Many of these manuscripts are attributable to folk healers and also to itinerant healers. Itinerant healers were the first who were considered worth a biography in Chinese historiography. That is in Sima Tian's Shi Ji of the yeah, first century BCE. And they have been through the ages and some estimates are even up to this day, the largest group of healers available, accessible to the general public in China. And their therapies are rarely documented in printed literature. We know that itinerant healers formed a group 
with a group consciousness. They had certain rules. They followed certain norms. They had, for instance, certain poems that everybody should know. And each day was designated in the calendar with one character of these poems. And on that particular day where this one character was assigned to, you were not allowed to use that character from dawn to dusk. And there were heavy penalties. Nobody knows how to <laughs> pursue such transgressions, etc. But there were these internal codes and um, they had therapies that are different from standard traditional medicine and that's why they're rarely documented in printed literature. But we find many of them in these 1,100 um, the recipes. There is, for instance, lamb wick cauterization. You will not find a, war, a term for lamb wick cauterization, and I confess it's my invention or introduction, because it simply has never been described. Not a single book on the history of medicine in China, not a single Chinese book available today has written on lamp wick cauterization. That is, you ignite a lamp wick and instead of a needle, you point at certain, the flaming end at certain points on the skin to reach certain end. So here, for instance, Tian Dao Jing Feng, infantile convulsions as if suspended by heaven. And this, of course, you see uh, no. an American student sent this photo to me. She took a picture in the countryside of an old lady performing this type of lamp wick cauterization. And here are further examples, treatment of pox, text and illustrations, the lamp wick colorization manuscript of the 19th century. You have recipes of folk healers, this one from the early Republican era, to treat broken needle, broken acupuncture needle stuck in the flesh. I have not seen this recipe in any modern acupuncture primer. Yeah? Grind the brain of a rat to pulp and smear it. Is this mine? The alarm clock. Excuse me. Grind the brain of a rat to pulp and smear it on the location where the needle was inserted. This brings the cure. Yeah. Maybe it helps, maybe not. In a recipe collection of a folk healer, the early Republican era, we found recipes to prepare a pharmaceutical mechanical device to induce a premature termination of a pregnancy. Uh, the Bensao Gangmu, the largest encyclopedia on natural history and uh, health care ever compiled on the Eurasian continent, of 1593 has very many recipes for abortion. This is interesting because neither Confucianism nor Buddhism really condone abortion, but of course in these manuscripts you have many and interesting enough also in the Bensagangu, usual printed text of uh, Chinese medicine do not have many or even one or two abortion uh, remedies. And of course, as these manuscripts tell us, the reasons why you would want to have an abortion are the same as everywhere. People are too poor to raise another, or these are unmarried girls, or uh, servants, uh, uh, or, yeah, or people, women are too ill or have too many children already. And of course, there's enough understanding that they require and should get an abortion. There's one very explicit manuscript, we could go into detail, which shows 
a recipe for preparing a vaginal tampon or abortion. We look at the text Ado, Croton, Hongyang, Banmao, Mr. Beetle, Zaudia, etc., etc. We don't have to go. For each month of pregnancy, so if you are in the third month, fourth month, fifth month, add one fun of musk. And this recipe is for external use. Take the first eight substances listed above, grind them to a fine powder, mix it with tsung bai, the white uh, segment of an onion stalk, to form a ball shaped like a turtle head, which is a popular term for glance penis, or a horse mouth into the turtle head and insert the medication that is a musk into this hole. Then wrap the turtle head shaped ball into a piece of cloth and tie it with a string. Take a bamboo tube and pass one long end of the string through it. Let the woman sit calmly and insert the item into her vagina so that it reaches the flower heart, which is a popular term for the opening of the cervix. She will feel some pain and the fetus is aborted immediately. Remove the medication. It is not possible to effect an abortion once the sixth or seventh month of pregnancy has been reached. If this uh, is not entirely clear, you have uh, it uh, uh, on here in, uh, in, in these four steps in detail. The turtle have prepared from the eight drugs, then the horse mouth filled with musk, then this is wrapped with cloth and tied up with a string, and this then is, uh, the string is uh, drawn through a bamboo tube for easy insertion. So this is just to show you some of these manuscripts are extremely detailed and um, offer information that you simply don't find in printed literature. And then you also read arguments prepared to convince, convince women to use an abortion inducing prescription. If you are not convinced, just look at unmarried girls and widows. What family would even secretly pay for a midwife? Yeah. So you better adopt this advice. So this, of course, suggests that the author was a folk healer, not a formally trained physician. Uh, in China, in the countryside, but also in cities, I often had a chance to take photos of uh, itinerant healers. They come, they open their bag, they place a piece of red or yellow or whatever cloth on the ground, and then they lay down a few items and they try to attract the attention of passers-by. The image is bad. It is very bad. Usually they are considered to be cheaters and uh, no one believes them. So they have to develop an extremely psychologically clever rhetoric in order to make people stop and also in order to make people finally tell, well, I have this problem, or my wife at home has this problem, could you help us, etc., etc. In order to, to get patients or, or passers-by or an audience to come to you and offer you or ask you for advice, they have developed very interesting rhetoric strategies. And there is one of the most interesting manuscripts in the collection is this leporello, Ilung Zhihu, to treat dragons to cure tigers. They know what they can do. It is a leporello rhetoric manuscript of an itinerant physician. Uh, when I found it, I discussed it with Professor Zhang Jinsheng in Beijing, and we both couldn't make any sense of it. It has about 150 sentences and phrases. And uh, of course, it, it's immediately clear already from the title that this uh, has something to do with medicine. But it took us a while. And eventually, we realized these are 150 phrases that an itinerant physician must be able to use immediately when confronted by a suspecting or suspiciously by an audience filled with disbelief. So, you are here today and you will be gone tomorrow. 
why should we believe you know, medication, etc., etc. So for maybe 150 or 200 such possible questions, these were the answers. And they're very interesting, very interesting. We have, of course, manuscripts written by martial arts practitioners. This one is how to immobilize an opponent. How to immobilize an opponent. This is based on a blood circulation theory you would not find in any printed book. It assumes that the blood is a short worm or something like a train moving from station to station. And the martial arts specialist knows at four in the afternoon it is the train or the bloodhead chateau arrives here at two in the afternoon, it arrives here, at four in the afternoon here, at six there, etc., etc. So, at any time of the day, you know where it is, and then you simply need to have a brush or a chopstick or a feather, something very light, and you tip at that point where the blood hit the shadow is at that moment. And then the blood stalls, and your opponent is immobilized and then you can decide whether to finish him or her or whether to do something though, so that it was considered to be just a warning. I don't know of any printed text. Demonology and exorcism, up to this day of course very popular in China and many manuscripts are filled with these characters. And that, of course, is a fascinating phenomenon. For centuries, probably for millennia, very intelligent and creative people believe that these types of characters, the messages written in these manuscripts, were really helpful also to cure diseases. You have recipes for all types of diseases and these characters are to be written. They may be written on a piece of paper and swallowed or they may be written on some part of the body and a large fellowship even today creates ever new examples of these texts and uh, it's perhaps one of the most creative, most dynamic genres in Chinese traditional medical literature that we know of. And there's not a single of these characters that is arbitrary. They follow a very, very specific alphabet. And what you really have here is a second language it's not the language you learn when you study classical or modern Chinese. These are different characters. This is a very different language. It is a means of communication between humans and demons or spirits, but as we see also between humans. And that's very interesting because it's something like a secret language that is open only to a closed community of informed persons. One of the manuscripts in the collection tells us that in a month of 30 days, for each day, there is one demon responsible for diseases on that day. And you must know the demon, and you must know its name. The names are all given here, and you must know what it does to the body and where it usually hides or sits in your house or wherever you are. And then you can address it and then it the manuscript tells you how to kind of eliminate the threat and how to cure the disease. And of course there is a 31st demon that can be active any day. It's so interesting. Therapeutic exorcism by means of finger gestures, yeah, 
also a folk medical practice that has not made it into modern textbooks on traditional Chinese medicine. Finger gestures where demons are influenced by certain finger movements. As I said earlier, there are copies also of printed books. Printed books sometimes with a very new design. And uh, of course, they are valuable too. Because very often, those who copied such printed books, they added their own assessments, their own information. Yes, this is interesting. No, don't use this. Yes, this has helped grandma, etc. So we found very many interesting addition in these texts, and uh, this is why they are valuable too. Many, of course, are simply recipe lists, perhaps by pharmacists. Pharmacists had two recipe lists or manuscripts offering two types of recipe lists. One, like this one, where you have the name of a pill and you have the ingredients. And this is presumably secretly kept by a pharmacist because a pharmacist does not want to tell the public what is in these recipes. What, is, what are the substances making up a pill or decoction, whatever. The recipes in Chinese medicine, when they were effective, have, and this is true up to this day, been kept secret because they are guaranteed income and you don't want to lose this income, so people keep these valuable recipes secret. And very many recipes are ad advertised as formally kept secret by this and that family, family secret recipe, etc. That means it's very valuable. And when a physician has a specific remedy or recipe, he does not want the pharmacist or anybody else to know it. So he gives the patient four different recipes and he says, one on this piece of paper you must buy from a pharmacy in the north of the city. This you must buy from a pharmacy in the south of the city. This from a pharmacy in the west and this from a pharmacy in the east. And then at home you mix the ingredients and prepare your decoction. And the aim was, of course, that no pharmacist should know that this is a valuable and effective recipe and should ask the client, oh, uh, who wrote this, etc. And what for what is it? So by asking patients to purchase one quarter here, one quarter there, one quarter there, and one quarter there, physicians try to make sure that the recipes remained secret. Uh, of course, since uh, these manuscripts also date from the early 20th century, uh, you do have some already incorporating Western chemical substances and modern uh, pharmaceutical substances. Very interesting, helps you to understand how these Western type substances were integrated into traditional thinking. As in the beginning, we saw the aspirin uh, recipe and it is given a very interesting traditional theoretical explanation. One type that interested us most was folk opera libretti. You go to China, countryside and even in some cities or towns today you'll see either dilapidated old stages or stages that are still um, active. And in the old days, prior to TV, etc. age, there were many, many small opera troops that roamed the country and would offer one, two or three nights a play and collect a little money and then go on. And in our manuscript collection, we found something that has never been 
written on, has never been analyzed, has never been described, that is folk opera libretti, to popularize the nature of around 550 pharmaceutical drugs. I mean, we don't know who wrote these manuscripts. We don't know who is behind these libretti, but these can't have been people without a very precise and extensive knowledge of Chinese traditional substance-based therapy. I mean, imagine 550 pharmaceutical drugs in an opera. Now, first of all, we have to ask, why would anybody leave his home at night and go to an opera to listen a pharmaceutical didactic piece? Well, the answer is immediately uh, obvious when you read these. They are dramatic. There's lots of fighting, army against army, men against men, men against spirits, demons against men, etc. They are humorous. They have many, many passages where normal confusion or norms are violated. And of course, people laugh. And they are extremely obscene. They are extremely obscene. I remember in Munich, when I was still in Munich, there was a young student and she said, I would love to write my doctoral thesis on folk opera libretti. And I said, fine, here, please. And she looked at them and three weeks later, she returned it, gave them back to me and said, I wouldn't be able even to show it to my parents. So no one ever has written on these opera libretti. It's still open. Yeah. Professor Zhong Jincheng in Beijing, when I ended, or when we, my wife and I, ended purchasing and collecting these manuscripts in China, uh, we thought we should write something. We should write a brief catalog, maybe half a page for each of them. So 1,000 manuscripts, half a page to characterize them, maybe a book with five, 600 pages comes out. I asked Professor Zhang Jincheng because I would say it's impossible for a non-Chinese, not even for a young Chinese, to read all these manuscripts and uh, go through them and see their characteristics, etc., etc. These manuscripts, as we have seen, sometimes are written in beautiful calligraphy, but often enough in a handwriting that was not designed to be read by a foreign sinologist. And of course, people would simply use the shortest character instead of a long character. So you may have E with 13 strokes. Why should someone for private use who reads by listening use a complicated character with 14 strokes if there is a character with one stroke that also is read E? We, of course, with our eyes, read these texts and see E, one stroke, and think, what could that mean? A knowledgeable Chinese or the author who wrote these manuscripts, he listens when he reads E and knows here is something with 14 strokes. So I was very, very lucky to be able to invite Professor Zhang Jincheng to come to Munich, and rather than five, 600 pages, we ended up with three volumes altogether, 2,600 pages. So this catalog was then printed by, um, by Brill in the Netherlands. And here I come to the title of tonight's talk, that is historical resources. The question is, these are handwritten records. Are they evidence of past events only? or do they offer hints at a future usefulness? And again, I was very lucky to have in Berlin collaborators, Herr Otte, Herr Prackwieser, Herr Kirk, and others who helped us or who came together to build a data bank, a data bank based on a hypothesis. The hypothesis was 
Chinese have been very, very astute observers for thousands of years. And they have tried virtually all items nature offers, plants, animals, minerals, you name it, even artificially produced objects. And they have used them for this or that disease, for reasons we don't know today. But they observed the results of such applications, and they prepared recipes, bringing different substances together. And maybe some were not useful, but others definitely were useful. And then we believe that truly effective recipes, recipes have been recommended more often. So they must be present more often in these manuscripts than recipes that are, oh, if nothing else helps, you might also turn to this or that. And based on this hypothesis, we continue that the effects of complex recipes rest on chemical interactions during pharmaceutical preparation and metabolic processes. And here it becomes difficult because our pharmacological models, and this is what we also learned when we studied pharmaceutical sciences, we still try to find the one effective molecule in an herb, or in flower or whatever. And we, of course, know by now, by now that if you put different herbs together, the many molecule, molecules each herb itself contributes then in the process of heating, etc., etc., and pharmaceutical technological preparation, these many mole molecules interact and maybe something different comes out, maybe several molecules result that then have their effects in the human body. And it is very difficult for modern pharmacology uh, to, um, yeah, to trace these effects to the molecules uh, that uh, they originate from. And again, we were lucky that Munich Bicol, Emily Lamotke, who is also here tonight, grateful for your attendance, <laughs> that a molecular biology lab in Munich, where the lab is actually in Shanghai, helped us to go through recipes and substances and find molecules and fractionize to see who or what could be responsible for these effects. And the recipes are designed on the basis of a legal principle and reflect the physician's understanding of a disease. So this, of course, is also something that is very individualized. Yeah? Each physician has a different background, has a different length of experience, and may end up with a different prescription putting together different substances. With all this, we looked at the purely devoted to recipes, manuscripts in the collection. And um, we found altogether more than 50,000 medical recipes. And the task was from the manuscripts to digitize the contents, which was extremely difficult because we send many of these manuscripts to China, where you have companies that specialize in digitizing handwritten Chinese texts. We got several thousand of questions back, can't read this, can't read that, can't read this, can't read that. Unfortunately, Professor Zhang Jinsheng here was instrumental in our ability to answer these questions and to eventually digitize all of these tens of thousands of recipes and uh, create a data bank. A data bank where altogether 51, 41,000 plus recipes from basically finally 227 manuscripts with 3,000 or more than 3,800 principal ingredient names and 12,900 synonyms. Just imagine, I mean, China, such a huge country, Germany, such a small country, you have different names from one and the same 
Item, Waldbeere, Blaubeere, Heidelbeere, etc., from north, the south, and east, and west. In China, of course, with different people, different ethnicities, different languages, and 2,000 years history, uh, you have huge numbers of synonyms that appear in these manuscripts. It is not such that one could say, okay, here are the manuscripts, here are the recipes, we write them down. The, the, the time to eventually identify the substances mentioned in recipes took extremely long, it was very difficult. As I said, we were very happy to be able to work together with Professor Zheng Jincheng, who is truly uh, a specialist without whom we would never have been able uh, to build this database. Uh, altogether, these recipes covered more than 3,000 ailment indications, and we assigned 40 indication tags. 75% plant medication, 10% minerals, 9% animals, and a few fungi. The data bank, for those of you who are familiar with data banks, uh, I mean, I don't have to explain this. I wouldn't even be able, I guess. Um, but what is essential is the front end. And soon enough, this front end will be available to the general public. We have now almost completed the background, the back end and the front end of this data bank. And it will soon be handed over to the Staatsbibliothek. And then it will be available worldwide and you can ask all types of questions and come up with all types of answers that are related to substance-based therapies. And the, the data are most interesting because such a data bank allows you to ask for all types of recipes for a number of symptoms or for specific symptoms. And then you take a look at the, at the, the, the cures proposed, and then you see that certain ailments are very, very closely related uh, to other ailments because the, the recipes recommended for cure overlap. And here you see relationships that we may not even recognize in Western medicine. For instance, arthritic psoriasis. Until not long ago, psoriasis was considered a dermatological disease and arthritis, of course, something else. You go to two different practitioners. Now, for the past 20, 30 years, we know in Western medicine that arthritic psoriasis is one problem which may appear here or may appear there. And such, such um, relationships we already see in these network uh, pictures. Or we see that uh, there is a therapeutic overlapping and that indications are related that we would not immediately see uh, from a Western point of view, and this, of course, allows us to go further into the matter and look at the individual substances, whether they are uh, helpful even in modern health care. So these manuscripts, and I have to scratch here only the surface, because to talk on this data bank would require another one, two or three hours. Yeah. So please uh, bear with me that I only kind of hint at the potential of this data bank, and this data bank, in turn, is based on our collection. So the collection is not only valuable in that it shows us, uh, offers, uh, offers, uh, opens us a new window to the past, it also offers us hints at interesting therapeutic strategies that might be um, helpful in further development of our modern pharmaceutical uh, therapies. The intensity of substance use in recipes for one specific indication tells us 
These are all different substances. They all appear in treatments for one and the same therapeutic indication. And the different lines and the different sizes of the circles tell us how often they appear together, how often they yeah, may just be considered chance encounters in recipes. And based on this, we can uh, take a closer look at combinations of substances. And as I said, these combinations of substances, either through uh, pharmaceutical processing or through metabolic processes, uh, may form something very different, uh, new molecules, new effects that individual substances um, fail to offer. Yeah, with this, I close. Thank you for staying here. Thank you for listening. And perhaps I've been able to convey to you uh, my and my wife's impression that this is a unique collection. And uh, interestingly enough, these manuscripts have never been considered worth further study or research in China or anywhere else. So the Staatsbibliothek with this collection of 1,100 uh, copies has a unique treasure that, as I hear from you, is quite frequently um, sought after now because more and more of these manuscripts are scanned. And if you go to the catalog of the Staatsbibliothek and uh, type in Sammlung Unschuld, then you have immediate access to these manuscripts. Some of them are very thin, maybe just 20, 30, 40 pages. Some of them are two or three volumes, 50, 60, or 100 pages each. And nowadays, with modern means, you can go through these manuscripts from one page to another, enlarge them, take a look at them. Very wonderful. So, thank you very much for tonight.